Okay, we'll use this. There we go. Uh, so Living Seawalls is a project that tries to enhance artificial structures in the marine environment. And the reason that these structures need enhancing is because they're usually very different to natural shorelines. So when you see an image of the natural shoreline, it's generally horizontal or gently sloping. There are lots of different features on the surfaces, such as rock pools, crevices, little holes, lots of lots of different types of microhabitats for organisms to colonise because different organisms require different types of conditions. And when you're a really, really small animal, small differences in humidity, temperature, um, shade, they make a really big difference to how comfortable you can live. So um, on the natural shoreline, we have all of this space available uh, for organisms to live and to thrive. I'm pressing the wrong button. But on artificial structures such as seawalls, the available space is a lot smaller. The uh, orientation is generally vertical and the surface is very smooth and flat. There's no variation, nowhere for organisms to hide and seek refuge. Uh, there are also differences in shade. So uh, piers and wharves, they uh, provide a lot of shade for a, a wide a wide surface area. And even though some areas of the natural shoreline are shaded, there's not nearly as much as provided by these artificial structures. A lot of these types of um, differences result in lower biodiversity around artificial <laughs> structures and around urbanised coastlines in general. So what Living Seawalls is trying to do is make these artificial structures more like the natural shorelines so that more uh, a wider variety of species can colonise there. Wrong button again. So Living Seawalls um, has designed these habitat enhancement panels. They are modular. They fit together into as small or as large an area as is needed. Each of these enhancement panels has unique habitat features that are based on natural features, features of the natural line. So we've got um, a pattern here we call the honeycomb, which is mimicking the um, erosion patterns on sandstone. We've got rock pools here. These retain water at low tide. Uh, we've got these kelp holdfasts here. So kelp and other seaweed, they don't have roots. They have what's called holdfasts which are these tendrils that grow around the rocks and burrow into those nooks and crannies. That's how they stay exactly held fast onto the rocks. So we have these kelp holdfast designs where the, those holdfasts can really grow around and loop around those little, um, those little loops. I guess that's what you call them. Uh, we've got these horizontal crevices. Uh, we've got um, designs that mimic sponge fingers that stick out and um, general erosion patterns. So we've got um, 10 designs all together and we use a combination of those different designs in um, certain locations so that we can provide that wide variety of habitat choice. So this is um, one of our first living seeds in Sawmillers Reserve. Um, this is not long after colony, uh, after installation, so about three months, and already you can see a lot of barnacles starting to colonise the area. Um, what we've done is stuck these little temperature loggers here. Um, they're really tiny, small loggers so that we can get right into those nooks and crannies so we can measure the difference in temperature. So we know from doing this that inside the rock pool and inside these little crevice ledges, it can be up to 10 degrees cooler than the outer surface. So if you're a really small organism, you can get um, refuge from the sun in these areas, which otherwise wouldn't be provided on a flat wall. Uh, we've got living sea walls in quite iconic locations as well. This is right under the Harbour Bridge uh, where we have been able to see the difference in um, what the textured panels uh, support the species that the textured panels support compared to 
uh, this non-modified section you see all here. Uh, we've got a living seawall at Blues Point. Um, this one was um, an experiment to see uh, whether different um, types of designs can support different types of organisms higher up on the shore um, than the others. So we found that these rock balls, because they retain water at low tide, um, small algae or small seaweed that generally we only find in this lower zone can grow up here in the higher zone because they have that available water. And this is what we find on a natural shoreline as well. Inside those rock pools, we do find, <clears throat> excuse me, additional uh, species of seaweed. Uh, this one is at uh, Fairlight Pool where uh, we try to mimic the structure of uh, Neptune's necklace seaweed. So I'm sure you've seen that around on the rocky shores. It looks like a little beaded necklace. So that's what we did. We used wooden beads and we made this seaweed. Um, and we put that on the panels immediately after installation so that we could provide a little bit of habitat structure to um, sort of kick off the ecosystem there. Uh, so what makes living seawalls apart from other sort of eco-engineering um, solutions is that living seawalls is... <coughs> excuse me. And what sets us apart from other organisations is that living seawalls is backed by science. So I'm out there doing... Um, uh, environmental surveys and biodiversity surveys to sort of quantify the impact that we have on the diversity of organisms in different areas. Um, we do things like um, use really, really tiny quadrats to delineate the tiny little microhabitats, what's going like what's going on inside the rock pool versus what's going outside the rock pool. Uh, for our installations at um, Barangaroo, we need to dive to conduct these um, biodiversity surveys. And um, luckily when we do them, we do see these very cute little fish staring at us when we're doing our biodiversity surveys. So um, even if you're diving in murky cold conditions, it's okay because you see these cute little critters and um, they're smiling back at you. Um, also, it's important to say that they wouldn't have this habitat if it weren't for this type of um, habitat enhancement modules. Uh, so we do have um, a few results from, from the um, earlier living seawalls that we've installed in Sydney Harbour. So at the Milsons Point Living Seawall, uh, our survey after two years found 91 species of fish, invertebrates and seaweed around the uh, living seawall at Milsons Point. Um, this is compared to only 43 species on the non-modified seawall. So after two years at this site, we've almost doubled the amount of species that are there. Uh, at the Sawmillers Reserve Living Seawall, we've um, investigated... Excuse me again. We investigated... Um, how many species live on the different panel designs. And we found that the rock pool panel supports the highest number of species, with 102, compared to only 28 species that colonise the flat panels as our comparison. So that's um, really, really promising. Um, but this uh, study also told us that we can't just rely on one design to do biodiversity we do need that range and that variety of different designs. At our living seawall in Quantaf, we found 36 species of fish in total, but more importantly, only six of those species were found at the living seawall, not at any of our comparison sites within that same bay. And this was after three years. And, um, in part due to our success, we were a finalist in the inaugural Earthshot Prize. So the Earthshot Prize is an international prize that was started by the Royal Foundation of um, Prince William and Princess Catherine. So uh, we were a finalist in the group for uh, Revive Our Ocean. There were three finalists worldwide. Unfortunately, we didn't win. We lost out to the coral people. 
But um, being a finalist has really opened up a lot of um, a lot of opportunities for us to um, expand our research, but also expand our reach to spread our solution worldwide. Um, so this is just um, the Earthshot goals. Um, so by 2023, they have five categories for improving our environment and um, revive our oceans is one of them. But, um, yeah, we've had a lot of opportunities with Earthshot. We've met a lot of influential people and those influential people have connected us with um, uh, organisations who can support us, support us with, you know, legal matters, support us with expanding our, our, um, our reach to different countries where we might not have uh, contacts already and also providing us with funding for our research. Um, and that has led directly to our, our living seawall in Lima, in Peru. So through the Earthshot Prize, we've partnered with DP World, who uh, have a lot of port infrastructure around the entire world. And that's an enormous amount of space that can be ecologically enhanced. We do know that port structures are essential. I mean, we need them. That's part of our lifestyle right now. Um, but instead of saying, no, ports are bad, they're bad ecologically, what we can do is say we can enhance them and we can make them useful for both humans and the natural environment. So that's what we're doing here. We're putting these living seawalls designs, um, our designs to provide a different habitat variety for organisms, and they're being incorporated into the new construction of this port in Peru. Uh, so all of these different designs and different textures um, will be investigated. Uh, we are liaising with a research team in Peru so that we can conduct these biological surveys, also biodiversity surveys, <clears throat> and um, see how the magnitude of enhancement that can be ha that can happen in Peru. And um, we would like to use this as a blueprint to enhance ports around the world. So we have living seawalls in four continents already, in cities of urban areas around the world. Uh, we will hopefully uh, in February have our first living seawall in North America. So that will make us present on five continents around the world. Um, and we're actively trying to um, find locations in Africa that we can work in. But um, yes, we do have a lot of sites in Australia and already we have over 2,500 living seawolf panels out there in the world supporting the local marine community. But we are still very keen on helping out in our own backyard. So um, with the help of Mossman Environmental Foundation, we installed the very first living seawall uh, at Ellery Park in the Mossman area, uh, which is great to see. And hopefully that will be the first of many uh, habitat enhancements that we um, implement in the Mossman area. Uh, with so much information about how our seawall habitat panels work and um, how so much evidence to show that the solution uh, is a viable solution. We are expanding into enhancing different types of artificial structures. So uh, in Lavender Bay, we introduced our living boulders. So these are boulders that um, have these rock pools in them because we know that rock pools are such an important habitat. These are designed for boulder shorelines or riprap shorelines. Even though they use natural stone, the shoreline itself is artificially constructed. So in Lavender Bay, this used to be a um, just a uh, rock platform, rocky shore, gently sloping. Uh, but council decided to uh, to stabilise the shoreline and stop erosion by putting these boulders in here. Um, they are natural stone, but what they lack are the rock pools. Um, so they do have those nooks and crannies but there is no water retention at low tide. So that's what these living boulders do. We've interspersed them amongst the uh, larger boulders <clears throat> and um, we installed them in April of this year and already in June, uh, we had really good colonization of this 
of this green algae. Um, that green algae is the favourite food of um, gastropods like snails, limpets. They love this. So um, hopefully when we do the uh, six-month uh, biodiversity survey next week, we will see a lot more mobile organisms and hopefully a few oysters and mussels. Uh, we are also wanting to enhance moth piles. So, you know, these are all around Sydney Harbour and they have the same problem as the seawalls. They're vertical, they're flat and they're smooth. Also, quite often to protect the wharf pile, uh, they are covered in this black plastic. It's really smooth and slippery, so organisms find it really hard to settle on there and stay stuck to it. Um, and they're designed to be anti-fouling. So what we want to do is put these modules over the top. These modules have these different designs, very similar to what's on the seawall panels, and they can provide that additional habitat for organisms in the structure. Um, what we can also do is transplant kelp, live kelp, onto these so that um, it can provide that biogenic habitat uh, at the very beginning. Uh, we will be installing these in Sawmillers Reserve uh, in the first week of December. So hopefully that will be the first of the things. We also have um, larger projects coming up. Um, so the new Sydney fish markets that's under construction right now, there will be a living seawall there uh, with just under 300 panels. So that's a really great um, site for these living seawalls. And it really shows that, um, that uh, construction companies, government and designers are thinking about co-designing new structures to benefit humans and nature. Uh, also the new circular heat renewal, um, we will be part of that and there will be some living seawalls habitat enhancements uh, involved and incorporated into the new designs for circular key. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I will leave that and I'll um, hand over to Minna. She'll be talking about uh, her work at the Living City Mall in Lurie Park. Oh, sorry. I've actually got two questions, uh -huh. but happy if someone else is going to intervene in mine. So the temperature sensors that you're using, how do you go about collecting the data that that's capturing? You can just download from the sensor. You have to go to the sensor, plug something in and capture Yes, so we, the sensor has a battery life of three months, um, collecting data at um, one point per hour. So uh, we go and install them, leave them for three months, and then collect them. Thank you. Yes. What material are they made from? Uh, the panels. So yeah, the, the sea walls. Yeah. So the the habitat panels are made from a eco blend of concrete. Uh, it's a similar blend to what's being used for marine construction right now. So um, we chose concrete because it's commonly used material, but it also can be moulded. So the way that these living seawalls panels are made is that the design is um, digital. So uh, we work with an industrial designer um, who works for Reef Design Lab in Melbourne. Um, they uh, design these features of the panels using our data. So we've gone out and measured features of natural shorelines. We say we want these sorts of features, these sizes, this surface texture. That's designed digitally and then it's 3D printed so we can get exactly the features that we need um, translated into a 3D form. And then using that, we make a mould and from that mould, we can cast a lot of different um, a lot of different panels in any, any material that we want. So another thing that the Earthshot Prize has helped us with is connecting us with material scientists and we can work with them to find better materials to make our living seawalls from that are still sturdy enough to withstand marine conditions, but um, have less carbon in their production um, and even some that can be carbon neutral or carbon capturing. So that's our next step is that we really want to minimise the amount of cement 
that we use because cement is the most um, carbon expensive part. And um, yeah, look for look for um, better materials to use. And do you predict that you'll have to replace them at some point? Or is it like once they're there, they're basically there forever? So the current panels have been engineered tested for 20 years. Okay. Um, but we it, we envision that when they get overgrown, so organisms such as um, oysters in particular um, are really good at sort of cementing everything together. So we expect that with the increased growth, it will sort of um sort of meld together and then eventually the organisms hopefully will just make a reef of their own and not require that structure anymore. Um, yes, we'll go you first. Uh, yeah, so so what you've done is you've kind of been creating these kind of habitats from sort of non-habitat in the marine environment, right? Mm -hmm. Have you thought of kind of applying the same thing to the non-marine environment? Because I mean, like um, the outside walls of a building, for example, would, would seem to be quite kind of resistant to sort of um, uh, biodiversity. And, and I suppose in the, in the same way, you could have something like these things, which could make the, the, the walls of buildings and things. Like yeah, that. well, um, we are all marine ecologists working um, you know, on this project. So we don't have any knowledge of terrestrial ecology, but we would be very open to sharing our information uh, with terrestrial ecologists who, who want to, you know, adopt these sorts of designs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but yeah, unfortunately that's not our specialty, so yes. In projects like the DP World Project in mm -hmm. Lima, uh, where it's a new port being constructed, are you are they going to actually put in place uh, that be part of the structure? If the, the materials will be used, they won't be just applied panels or modular panels that you, they'll put on afterwards. It'll be actually in the structure yes, itself. Yes, it's carved into the pile caps themselves. Yes, yes. I don't guess I was going to ask the same question as a matter of fact. You know, obviously, it's a far better way to do it. You pile drive yes. a, an environment into the seabed, and that's yes. it. Yeah. Yes. So um, at the moment, these, <coughs> these panels are designed to be retrofit because they're over 50% of Sydney Harbour shoreline has a seawall or some sort of revetment wall, some sort of hard structure. And there's so much existing structure that we can enhance. And that's what these panels are designed for. Um, but what we would like to do is talk to um, talk to construction companies at the design phase, so that we can incorporate our living seawalls designs, the surface geometries and textures into the building. And that's really what we want to change in terms of mindset when when designers are, are creating these new structures is that they need to include these sorts of things so that it's beneficial for humans and nature and that's um that's good that with the circular key renewal project where we've got in um in talking with them quite early so that we can incorporate our designs into the, the wider design so it's not just an afterthought where they just install it afterwards okay. Um, yes, we'll have these last two questions. Yes, you first. Um, I noticed in one of the images that there was a lot of recruitment of algae on the bolts compared to the immediate area around it. What are the bolts that are holding the panels on made of? And is there a reason algae might have a good taste for it? Uh, so they're made of uh, marine grade stainless steel, um, SS316, if that makes sense to you. Um, uh, I have noticed that at some sites, um, organisms like to recruit to the thread of the rod. Um, I assume it's because it's so textured. And particularly when you're an oyster and you're really, really small, that's when you're um, more vulnerable to predators. And so if you can find a little niche for you to really get into, uh, then you're more protected. And I'm, I, I'm just guessing, just from observation, I think that might be one of the reasons. Thank you. Yeah, and last question. Uh, it's a bit top of mind at the moment, but with Cockatoo Island uh, undergoing a lot of civil repair, or uh, federal government has been given to do that, is uh, are you going to do anything with them while they're in the process of repairing these seawalls? We have talked to them. It's up to them. We've, we've um, presented a proposal. It's up to them. It's in the master plan that came out yesterday. Yeah. We won't do anything. Thank <laughs> 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 you.
It's something that looks very much like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, um, I was doing your seaboard project as well. Oh, okay. Yes, we um we have presented a proposal to them, so yeah, we're waiting to hear back from them. But yes, Cockatoo Island is a perfect location for our sort of enhancements. Not just with the sea walls, but the new wharfs that they're putting in. They also have um, a large boulder riprap shoreline. So yeah, it's a lot of areas that that um, we can do some work in. Okay, so I think um, I should hand over to Minna now, and I'll let her introduce herself to you. Um, okay. One's yours. Okay. You just have to the left one. I just kept on clicking the wrong one. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is Menin. I'm a PhD student at Macquarie University, and my supervisor is um, Melanie, Professor Melanie Bishop. I don't know how to return to the previous slide. Right, oh, Okay, that's okay. Um, and so I'm very excited to share with you um, some of the work that we've been doing at the Mosman Living Seawall, um, which is part of my PhD project, and we like to call it Building Homes for Marine Life. So Aria has shared with us um, how marine built structures such as seawalls are fundamentally different from the natural habitats that they replace and that they also support lower native biodiversity. Artificial structures such as seawalls are typically um, have typically smooth and featureless surfaces that are low in three-dimensional complexity. Mm. So what is habitat complexity? It is the three-dimensional physical structure of an ecosystem that plays a critical role in mediating the dynamics of the different organisms, and it significantly influences biodiversity. Complex structures typically have greater surface area and provide more protective spaces from environmental stressors such as heat and desiccation and predation, and they also provide more feeding opportunities by providing more environmentally suitable conditions. And how can we add habitat complexity to artificial structures such as seawalls? Um, we can do this by um, installing mimics of natural habitats or um, habitat enhancing units, such as um, the panels at the Mosman Living Seawall where um, we have a mix of sponge fingers, kelp holdfasts, oysters, and rock pools, and these different types, uh, these different designs, which have different holes and crevices, and um, differences in shading and moisture will also benefit different types of organisms. We can also um, add habitat complexity by transplanting habitat forming organisms or ecosystem engineers, such as oysters, um, oysters can create or maintain a physical habitat. And another great thing about oysters is that they um, are suspension feeders and they filter nutrients and particulate matter from the water column. So to enhance the effects on biodiversity, we can combine these two, two approaches by transplanting habitat forming organisms onto mimics of natural habitats, which is what we did um, at the Muslim Living Seawall with some amazing volunteers. So we transplanted 20 oysters onto a specific area on each of all of the different panel designs. We placed 10 oysters inside the unique protective spaces of each panel design, and we placed 10 oysters outside the protective spaces. So um, this is a beautiful photo of the Mosman Living Seawall. The panels um, are found on the mid and the low um, intertidal heights. So the panels on the low intertidal heights are submerged for a longer period of time compared to the ones um, at the mid. There are six different um, panel designs. We have kelp holdfast, oyster, sponge fingers, texture, rock pool, and control. So there are four replicates per panel design um, on each um, tidal elevation. 
So we wanted to find out, do oysters survive on the panels? And will their survival depend on panel design and whether the oysters are placed inside or outside the protective spaces from environmental stressors and fish predators? And how do the different panel designs and the presence of oysters influence other species? So we did this by um, sampling the panels on the areas with the oysters and on the areas without the oysters. And we also deployed um, underwater cameras um, we turned um, the video on for over about an hour um, at high tide for a period of three days. And we did this um, over um, several months. A couple of months. So we expect that oyster survival will be higher inside the protective spaces of the different panels. More marine life will be amongst the, oyst amongst the oysters compared to um, the areas without the oysters. The different panels will support different um, organisms and that the fish will feed more on the areas of the panels with oysters. So um, the oysters have been on the panels for over six months now, and I'd like to share with you some of our results so far. Um, these graphs show oyster survival, oyster percentage survival, um, over the different months of um, sampling. And this is at the mid and low intertidal elevations and the different um, lines um, represent the different panel designs. Overall, survival was quite good uh, on the panels at about 50%. Um, we can see that um, the oysters on the mid intertidal panel survived a bit more than the ones on the low. Um, which were submerged for a longer period of time. So there was more opportunity for the fish to prey on the oysters. Um, and interestingly, we found that at the mid intertidal um, elevation, the control panel actually had the um, highest survival. Well, um, why was it that um, the control panel had um, a higher survival compared to the other panel designs? So, um, well, if we remove this, you'll see that um, the green columns represent um, inside the protective spaces and the yellow columns are represent outside the protective spaces and the control panel, which had no protective spaces, has only um, one column. Um, yeah. <laughs> There we go. Um, in both tidal elevations, um, survival uh, inside the protective spaces was much higher. And um, the survival at the uh, inside the protective spaces um, was almost 100%. So most of the mortality actually occurred when the oysters were placed outside the protective spaces. Here, um, for example, with this kelp hold fast panels, you can see that all of the oysters outside the protective spaces are dead. And inside where we put them um, inside the crevices, most of them survived. Um, as for um, the number of feeding fish that we found on the panel, so these graphs show the number of feeding fish and the different panel designs on areas in areas with oysters and without oysters. And here we just pooled um, all of the areas with oysters and without oysters. And we found that um, fish preferred to feed on more complex panels compared to the control, and that they also preferred to feed more on areas with oysters compared to areas without. I have a, um, so here you can see um, fish feeding on the oyster side of the panel. I mostly saw um, Lederick and Brim nibbling at the panels in my videos. Yeah, okay. 
Now here, um, these graphs show the algal percentage cover um, on the different panels. We can see that um, in the low intertidal, all of the panels were um, mostly covered with algae, regardless of whether or not there were oysters in that area. Um, this is because um, the panels in the low intertidal were submerged for a longer period of time. And you can see on the mid intertidal, it was it, the panel designs that um, held moisture um, that had more algal percentage covers, such as the rock pool panels. Um, also, we found more types of algae um, on, in rock pool panels compared to uh, the other designs. As for um, the mobile organisms or invertebrates, these were the mulberry whelks, conniewinks, and other limpets. Um, we found more uh, mobile invertebrates um, in areas um, with oysters compared to the areas without. And um, in the control panels, which were otherwise featureless, I found them um, amongst the oysters that provided um, shading and protection. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but key results at this stage um, is that oyster survival was generally high on the panels with um, greater survival inside the protective spaces. There were little effects of oyster on the algae, but there were big effects of panel design. Um, the oysters had big effects on the mobile invertebrates. They um, definitely preferred to be with the oyster in the oyster areas and um, oysters were a key food source for the fish on the panels as well. So um, I will be continuing my sampling at the living seawall through to 12 months. And um, for results of this study, while there is really heaps more to be done, will help um, inform future eco-engineering efforts about which designs are more, most useful in promoting oyster growth and the biodiversity of marine life. That's the pelican that visits me um, whenever I do my sampling. She's gorgeous. So thank you very much for your kind of time. Yes. I'm quite familiar with the area where you put those panels because every Saturday I go kayaking and I used to go past them and I wonder kind of what they're doing. So it's good, good to hear about them. Um, in one of your pictures, you show the columns of the um, split bridge. Okay. Yes. And they're, they're, and, they're, and they're basically sort of just round concrete columns. Um, I'm always amazed because the, there are oysters completely mm -hmm. covering those kind of concrete columns. Yeah. Um, how does the sort of ecosystem created on those just plain concrete columns covered in oysters? How does that compare with the one that you've kind of created on these kind of eco panels? In other words, is, is the oysters on these kind of concrete columns, are they like a sort of natural eco panel? I'm just going kind of... to give it a try and then I'll ask <laughs> are you? Um... You, you would have seen it as well, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So definitely, um, those oysters have been around for a long time, and as ecosystem engineers, these oysters would have already provided a suitable habitat and to all of the other organisms that would be found on the, that concrete pile. And um, I didn't present it here, but I've actually also found a lot of oyster recruits um, on the different panels as well. Yeah, um, I can give a little bit more information. So yes, on the concrete piles and on sea walls around Sydney Harbour, yeah. there can be a lot of oyster growth, yes. Yeah. But um, the attachment points for the base oysters is not very secure. So it's still a flat wall and it's fairly smooth. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you've seen around Sydney Harbour, sometimes when you look at the oyster line, you can just see gaps of bare wall. That's just where it's all come sloughing off because yeah. of a boat strike, because of storm surge or something like that so yes they can grow there but they don't necessarily attach very very firmly and what living seawalls can provide is that additional surface area and surface rugosity texture like a rough surface so that they can glue themselves on really firmly 
Sure. Also, it's um, we haven't done the sampling at Spit Bridge, but the other um, control reference seawalls that we've sampled have this same sort of oyster cover, but the species diversity is still lower. Sure. So it's still not supporting as many species as our living seawall. And, and, and I think that would make sense to me because if I, if I was a little animal, I, would, I wouldn't really want to sort of, I mean, the, the, it's, it's, it's almost like re replacing a surface of concrete with a surface of um, uh, oysters. It's not as interesting and doesn't have all the diversity of, of what you create with your little hexagons. Yeah, Yeah, so oysters themselves, they do provide a lot of structure for small organisms because the, the, the spaces in between the shells um, provide a lot of refuge. So the fish can't get in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the oysters themselves need habitat and um, that's what the living seawalls can provide. And I think that's what Minen has shown um, with the oyster survivability. Great. You've got more questions. Oh, Nobody yeah. Sorry. Yes. Have you got a, a long-term plan or a long-term vision of when you will be able to uh, enable or encourage governments to put in major areas of this that will make a real difference? Me, thank you. I'm just hoping to finish my PhD for now. Um, well, that's our goal, is to encourage governments to initiate some sort of legislation um, to say that you do need to include ecological enhancements in any new design, um, living seawalls or otherwise. Um, we're starting to get, to get a little bit of traction with, you know, um, Cockatoo Island consulting us at the design phase, um, Circular Key consulting us at the design phase. So it's starting. Um, as for a timeline, well, we hope sooner rather than later. Um, and um, in Australia, we are opening up a dialogue with government and other policymakers um, to get this sort of rolling. But um, in other countries, it's a little bit slower. So um, what we can do is work in Australia as much as we can and use it as an example to roll out around the world. It's one thing. Is there any difference, you know, with the, the new fish markets? These all seal seal piles there. Is that going to be more of a problem than concrete piles? Uh no. What do you mean? Well, the piles that have been driving there, mm -hmm. they're, they're all steel piles, mm -hmm. and so attaching anything to the piles there is going to be different from attaching to you know concrete piles. Uh, for the marine organisms, or for us? For you to attach. Oh, okay. No, no, it doesn't make a difference. So the, the piles, they can be any sort of material. It doesn't really um, concern us. Same with the seawall, it can be any material. But um, for the marine organisms, anything smooth and slippery, it's just not good for them. Yeah. Thank you, Menon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have. Paula next. Uh, which one? Um, no, no, that's a sequel. I'm sorry for the low tech um, display. Okay, so hopefully we can all hear. Um, and yeah, so I'm doing my PhD. It's going really, really quickly, um, but I'm gonna talk to you today about some of the work that I've been doing at um, Sydney's newest living seawall site. And I think you guys are all gonna be pretty much experts on this site by now. Um, so um, about 40% of the global human population lives within hundred kilometers of the coast. And in Australia, that's even higher. So 85% of Australians live within only 50 kilometres of the coast. And these numbers are obviously only going to get bigger and bigger, right? So that means that our coastal ecosystems have a lot of pressure upon them from a whole bunch of different human activities. 
Um, so some of these activities you might be familiar with, um, things like erosion, overfishing, uh, pollution, um, but also marine construction is a really big issue as well. Um, so uh, when we're talking about marine construction in the coastal areas, we tend to be talking about things like jetties and pontoons and seawalls, which is the hot topic tonight, I guess. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. So, um, yeah, so seawalls have, um, that's in Sydney Harbour, seawalls take up over 50% of the shoreline. And that number is pretty similar in other major ports uh, globally. Um, especially in developed places like Sydney Harbour and um, places like Hong Kong and a lot of uh, ports in America. So um, we also can't really get rid of them because, um, you know, if the, so around the Opera House, that's all um, a seawall. But if we got rid of the seawall, then the Opera House would probably fall into the ocean and I don't think anybody would be too keen on that. So, um, yeah, we need to kind of live with what we've got. And um, yeah, seawalls have some really big differences in their habitat compared to natural habitat. So we can see this photo. So this seawall is actually down at um, Farm Cove, down at the Botanic Gardens near the Opera House. And then this rocky shore is just around the corner at Balmoral. Um, and we can see some pretty clear differences in um, the habitat that's available in these two photos. So in the rocky shore um, on the right, we can see there's a lot of nooks and crannies, there's crevices, there's those rocky boulders in the background that have some overhangs. So this all provides a bunch of different types of habitats for different types of organisms. So we have nooks and crannies and shaded areas so that um, little animals can um, hide from predators or they can, um, uh, so they don't get too hot during the middle of the day. And then also importantly, um, in the front there, we can see there's a whole bunch of rock pools. And so these are really important because they hold water at low tide. And if you're a marine organism, you probably want to be in the ocean. So um, rock pools generally have a whole bunch of different organisms and seaweed living inside them because they're wet all the time. Um, yeah, so compared to the picture of the seawall, where pretty much none of those habitats that I just mentioned are present there. So that has some big implications for what organisms can live on a seawall versus what can live in a natural habitat. Um, and that's also important when we think about what else we get from these ecosystems. So, um, for example, oysters, like Minan said, um, are really important too because they filter water, which means that now our water is clean and we can go for a swim. Um, or seaweed as well is really important because it produces oxygen. Um, uh, so it's really important in marine ecosystems. Um, so the living seawalls, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this now. <laughs> um, these are habitat panels that are designed uh, to mimic natural habitats, like what we've mentioned, um, uh, crevices and rock pools and things like that. So I'll skip over that because I'm assuming you guys are experts by now. So this is our newest site. This is the Mossman site, which is just underneath the Spit Bridge on the south end. Um, I'm there pretty much all the time. You guys should say hello if you see me. Um, this site has 48 panels um, and we've got six different designs. So um, here they are. Here they are. So um, this is all of them together. So we've, I've just put them, I'll go into them in a bit more detail in a second, but I've just put them together so you can see kind of an overview and how they'll all contribute, they'll all attract different types of organisms because they're all different. So we've got the first three, we've got rock pools, um, which everybody knows by now, hold the water at the low tide. Um, we've got texture, which is kind of mimicking the natural way that sandstone and other rocks um, erode naturally and provide, they make these little um, like depressions and little pits so that different types of organisms can attach there. And then we've got our control panel, the flat one, which is basically so that we are more easily able to compare what's happening on the living seawall panel to a regular seawall. Um, and then we've got, so these three are designed to mimic um, what we call biogenic habitat. So that just means that it's habitat formed by other types of living stuff. So the first one we've got the kelp hold fast. So this is the way that kelps hold onto the rock. It's kind of like the root of a plant. And that provides a really important habitat for a lot of different things like little worms and stuff. Um, we've got the sponges in the middle, which um, naturally form really big gardens. Um, and then the oysters as well. 
which, yeah, oysters tend to form really dense aggregations like you probably would have seen on the pilings underneath the bridge. Um, so they're very big 3D structures, which provide a lot of habitat, um, which a lot of little um, gastropods and things tend to, tend to enjoy hanging out there. Um, okay, so... So the Mossman installation is now one of very, very many um, in Sydney and globally now. Um, so what are, what's the point of me doing any more research, I guess? <laughs> so a lot of the other um, installations that we've put up, we know that they increase the biodiversity, um, but we don't really know what's going on in these very early, early stages. So that's kind of what um, my research is looking at. So those very, like early stages in the life of a living seawall, what's happening? Um, so it's important to look at um, the very early stages because what happens at the start can impact what happens at the end, right? So um, we need to know what's going on the whole way. So, yeah, so that's what I'm looking at, this kind of one-year section. Um, and, yeah, comparing um, what sorts of organisms are arriving to the living seawalls um, what order do they arrive in and how long does it take them to get there um, compared to natural rocky shores and normal seawalls? So there's been quite a lot of like previous work that's looked at the differences between regular seawalls and rocky shores. This is back before um, living seawalls was a thing yet. Um, and they found that regular seawalls tend to, um, organisms tend to arrive onto regular seawalls a lot slower than onto natural rocky shores. And since the kind of the point of the living seawalls is to be improving regular seawalls and try and make them more like natural habitats, um, we want to see if they're working in, um, in improving the um, organisms arriving as well early on in the, in the piece. So um, the Mossman installation is now just about eight months old. It got installed in February. Um, so that eight month photo, I took that on Monday actually. Um, so this is the exact same panel. We can see after two weeks, there's not a whole lot going on. Um, but after eight months, there's a whole bunch more stuff growing there, which is really exciting. Um, so, um, yes. Okay. So this is, um, the next few slides is going to be kind of zoomed in of like the cool stuff that I found. I haven't put any graphs in my presentation because I thought that was kind of boring. So it's just pictures. <laughs> so um, this is like, um, it, yeah, so the rock pool panels have most of the stuff, which um, you guys have heard by now, rock pools are really cool. Um, so this is some uh, grazing snails. So they're really um, important because they eat down the layer of like gross slimy algae that we don't really want, like a lawnmower. Um, so it's really cool that we're seeing a lot of different species of those. There's also some limpets, which do the same thing. So we really like the grazing snails. Um, we've also got some oyster recruits. So um, they're a bit tricky to see. They're a bit tricky for me to see in real life as well. So maybe just trust me. But there's some in those circles. Um, so that's really, really exciting that we're seeing oyster recruits um, because um, yeah, oysters are really, really critical in our marine environments for providing us with clean water. Um, so, oh, oh, that's a bit of a better photo. Uh, and in the background, you can see some of Minnan's big oysters. So, yeah, hopefully over time we'll see these baby oysters grow up into big oysters and be able to provide us with lovely clean water. <laughs> um, we've also got a whole bunch of algae that's growing, so seaweed. So we've got this bushy one that I found in one of the rock pools. And then this rock pool that I found that I reckon there's probably like at least eight or ten different kinds of seaweed in this one picture, which is just in this little tiny little patch um, of the rock pool, which is really, really awesome. It's really good to have different kinds of seaweed because some of them are a food source for different organisms. So we want to have different options for what they want to eat. And some of them as well um, provide <laughs> habitat. So it's good to have a range of different things, a range of different seaweeds providing different functions um, to make sure that we've got a healthy seawall ecosystem. Um, and these are just some other cool photos from my talented photographer friends who come out on my field work with me that we've found. Um, these weren't technically on the living seawalls, but they were very nearby. <laughs> 
they were very, they were like just down there and I was like, <laughs> so we've got this really cute little bubble snail. Uh, we do see a lot of crabs, but um they're too they they're too they move too quick for me to take photos. So uh, we do see a lot of them on the living sea walls though. And then we've got these cute, cute little baby green sea slugs, which are super, super tiny, like the size of your fingernail. So it's really exciting that there's so much life um, just on our doorsteps and that we'll hopefully be migrating onto the living sea walls really soon. Um, so um, what's the next steps? So we know that the living sea walls are increasing the biodiversity. That's really awesome. We know that biodiversity is really good. But um, the next steps are kind of uh, quantifying if the specific key organisms um, quantifying how much they're contributing to different ecosystem processes. So like I've mentioned a few times, oysters um, are really important for providing clean water by water filtration. And seaweed is really important for providing oxygen by photosynthesizing. So we have developed these chambers that you can see in the photo, which are kind of just like little sealed box, well, kind of big sealed boxes that fit exactly around each of the panels. So that might be why, you've, if you've noticed that at the Mossman site, the panels are really far apart compared to some of the other sites. That's so we can fit these chambers around them. And then basically what we can do is measure specific key um, processes that are happening and then attribute that to that specific panel. So we can see, um, so we could do like, really intense um, biodiversity surveys, like for example, counting the number of oysters and how big they are. And then we can measure how much water filtration is happening on that one panel by those exact oysters, um, which gives us a really good measure of um, the ecosystem health and the function that it provides. Um, so yeah, we'll keep doing biodiversity surveys and then hopefully get a few more of these chambers made. So yeah. Can you tell us more about how the chambers work? <laughs> um, yeah, so basically the chambers are like um, as close to a closed system as we can really get in nature. So they are they're water and air tight. So basically this is obviously taken at low tide because um, that's easier to work with. This is just our trial run. But um, in real life, what we're going to do is attach them and then they'll fill them up with water So and then it'll be at high tide. So they'll be full of water and underwater so that they don't get too hot. Um, and then we can put in a data logger inside the chamber um, and measure things like oxygen production or we can take water samples at the start and at the middle at the end. So we would do it for about an hour or so maybe, and we could measure different qual um, water quality traits. Um, yeah. Um, I think that's my last slide. Oh no, one more. Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm out there all the time. Come and say hi if you see me. Okay. Reason that you put the panels flat rather than as an angle because surely at an angle, well, I was thinking an angle you would get both top and underneath, and it's also more. Well, I guess they're not so the panels are not flush against the um oh, okay. wall, they're about that far off, uh -huh. so there is a there is a gap, right. so um. It's pretty hard to see behind there, but if you do have a look, there are things that grow on the back, but the back is just flat, so there's a lot more things that grow on the front. So putting it at an angle would not be more... I, um, it would probably influence what would grow there, but um, we also need to, I guess, keep in mind the function of the seawalls as well, right? If we have them really sticky out. Um, yeah, I can, I can get yeah. a bit of more information <laughs> from that. Uh, so, yes, so one thing, one reason why they're, they're offset a little bit is because they're existing seawalls. There's already oysters growing on them. We don't want to remove too much to begin with. Um, the reason why they're not at an angle or sticking out is that we don't want to increase the amount that it's sticking out from the seawall by. Um, so it was quite difficult to get councils on board uh, to begin with to put these sorts of things on. So I think adding any sort of angular angular sticking out parts would would have been additionally harder. Um, however, what we've done at Waterman's Cove in Barangaroo, where there is no seawall, so at that site what we've done is suspended um, our panels on a rig in um, hung uh, in between different piles. So um, we've created a sort of shoreline 
where there isn't any shoreline. Those are at a 30 degree angle. Uh, we did that so that they can catch more sunlight, so that more seaweed can grow. So yes, that's when we considered putting them at an angle to more mimic the natural shoreline and, you know, sort of address that sunlight issue. Um, I just want to know if you also tested the micro microbial biodiversity of the panels and time. I think somebody interesting. Is mm -hmm. here, if other people have done that. Um, yes, our previous PhD student, um, Kate. What's her name? Does <laughs> um, Kate Dodds. She um, looked at the biofilms uh, at the very beginning to see if that had an influence on what would uh, then grow on the panels. Um, she's about to publish that, I think. Do people ever use these as often? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reason I was asking is I only trust your ecological consultancy. And for that, there's a sort of a requirement that we have to do when you're designing a project that might have an environmental impact if you design as far as possible to avoid an impact. Uh, they are the being used as an offset in the UK. An offset. Um, and there are some projects that we've been working on where they're, they're requiring to have an offset. I mean, I suppose it isn't, isn't being used and it's terrible known, is it? In the UK, it is. Mm -hmm. um, the UK has um, legislation that says there must be, um, I can't remember the figures, but there has to be a minimum biodiversity or a maximum biodiversity loss. You have to offset by X amount. Mm -hmm. um, but in Australia, we haven't tested that here. Mm. But we would like to. Okay. Yeah. On that point, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Sydney on that topic, so I'd love to talk to you about it. An attack on So, just like more of a comment question uh, regarding the thing that you put on the panels to kind of quantify the chambers. Yeah, the yeah. chambers. And I was thinking that could be like if it turns out like good results, like a marketing strategy, kind of like each panel provides this amount of oxygen in this amount of time and this amount of filter water and all that. And it will be like a yeah, that, marketing strategy for that is the information that we need to present it as an offset option. We need more um, data to quantify exactly how much CO2 um, it's taking up, how much oxygen it's producing, how much um, nitrogen or other um, environmental functions, how it's performing. And that's what Ola is going to um, help us out with. Yeah, it does sound that it will be like very variable. In, like, in, in. Yeah, and this is the only site where, so a lot of the other sites in Sydney, at least, we're having a, having a lot of trouble getting the chambers to fit around them because they're so close together. So this is the only site that we have at the moment where we'll be able to put the chambers on. So it'd be really awesome in the future if we could have a few more sites as well. Because, yeah, exactly, like they're going to be super variable. Oh, there was a question. Oh, oh sorry, yes. yes. Uh, so in this work you talked about, then you're partnering with all kinds of organisations like sort of a um, port company in Peru and Mossman Council in Sydney, and you must have worked with the city of Sydney and all the rest of it. Oh, this is our so, <laughs> so, so, okay, well, that's fine. So, so I'll just ask a question. Um, how helpful are various organizations being? And uh, is, is the is that, I mean, like, is, is Mossman Council really helpful or is it? <laughs> <laughs> This is being recorded. <laughs> no, I don't think helpful have been great. They have a great team in their um, environment and sustainability group yeah. um, that have really been supportive of not just the VC walls but other Sims projects. Uh, so, yeah, they're um, really keen to do what they can. Okay. And, and this is, is what, what's, what's the sort of like, um, I'm just trying to get an idea of how cooperative, innovative, you know, different organisations are being whether there's some particular area where you, you want to do more but you can't. Okay. Or, yeah. yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying. So what has um, been most successful with us is to find a champion in that organisation who will support us, who will 
you know, um, take the reins and make something happen within that organisation. So we have those people at Mossman Council, we have those people at North Sydney Council, and now we have those people at DP World. So it's really about connecting with the individuals in that organisation who are really passionate about um, ecological enhancements and, and just making their environment better. So, yeah, it's really about connecting with those people. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious about the process of pitching this to council, to government agencies, or whoever it is that like needs to support you. Because uh, it seems very much like a win-win situation. So what is like the main pushback or the main criticism from, from councils? Um as in what would be the the like it seems like it's all pros, what would be the con kind of from their perspective? Um, I think one of the considerations is cost. Um, so there's you know budgetary constraints from with a lot of council. Um, and I think it's really it's really about finding the people who are passionate about it. And we don't always we aren't always able to connect with those people and it's difficult to find the right person to talk to in, in those sorts of instances. And the council environmental officers are often a good starting point, and a lot of those have interesting projects that they need to help with. So some of those that have yeah. those coastal councils might. Yeah, so um, Project Restore, which is the other large um, escape um, scale restoration program, which Living Sea Walls is a part of, um, they're in, currently kind of, um, dealing with um, a lot of councils in Sydney to, to do their habitat restoration work. So... Um, yeah, it's about finding the right people and also the right time so that they can, you know, present it to the people who make the decisions in the council. I guess some of it's because in general it's also new. Mm -hmm. These are only a few years old, so at this point in time you're still establishing to show that it works, to, like you're doing the science now to get the evidence to show that these things work. Yeah. And then you can expand it larger from there. Because sometimes it's difficult to find people that will be the first to put their hands up in terms of councils or things. But yeah, once you establish it, then you can develop it and grow up from there. Yeah, that's which is um on on the money there. And um yeah, so North Sydney Council, we had that person who was a champion for us. And um once North Sydney Council um had a few living sea walls installations and we started getting that data. Um, after one or two years that showed that biodiversity increase, it was much easier to get other councils on board. Do carbon credits come into this at all? That's what Orla can help us with as well. So carbon capture and also um, we are looking at um, kelp. So kelp is one of the main um, species that will be doing carbon capture in our oceans. So that's something that we're, we're actively working on. Yeah, a large organisation like TP World probably would be interested in this kind. Yeah, so kelp is generally not very successful in large pots, so I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if that would be, uh, <laughs> no, perhaps not. But um, in Chowder Bay, definitely, there's um, so much um, opportunity to um, to have a really thriving kelp forest. Yeah, yes. there was a question over here first. Um, I guess related to the carbon question, there's, um, there's been a lot of research out of the University of Tasmania about the carbon balance of oysters. And they've really struggled because they can't get a, an in-situ control. Mm -hmm. Have you considered when you do your encapsulation, really seeding the hell out of one of your, like, uh, that would be very, very valuable data. If you could get a real, a clean control on the carbon balance of your oysters. With, you you uh, mean uh, from a natural reef or from a yeah, on its yeah, single? One of your granted reefs, um, because it was excluded from Blue Cam, the, the, carbon credit framework because they couldn't get a control. Oh, it was a big part to get it into blue cam and it never made it in um, because it may be a net emitter and may be a net, they seem at different parts of their life cycle to be net emissions and net sequestration, but it doesn't, that only is the oysters, it doesn't factor the rest of the ecosystem. Okay. So that could be really great if you could get that clean control of an in-situ environment. Well, um, Mariana Maya Pinto, who is one of the Living Seawalls co-founders and all his um, PhD supervisor, she has done exactly that, um, quantified um, oyster filtration um, in uh, around artificial structures. So um, it's, yeah, I, I haven't heard what the problem in Tasmania and I, I don't really understand um, why they can find a control. So yeah, it's, um, 
that they couldn't really document that they were net sequestration across the whole lifespan. Okay. Um, well, that research was done at the University of New South Wales. So. Okay. Well, then Marianne probably knows the department. <laughs> yeah, I get a different department that's okay. used department at that. So. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, we'll have a last question before we move on to the CPOS project. So you oh, got a... Sure. Yeah, well, so if you may have been Kelp before, and there was just quite an interesting program on the uh, Australian story about somebody who was farming mm -hmm. seaweed in Tasmania. Uh, yes, yeah. that's, that's very box. So, yeah. 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 So, so it, it, it had all these kind of basically vertical ropes mm -hmm. just dangling into the water. Yes, so the, uh, this is the forest, yeah. and they are also an Earthshot Prize finalist this year. So um, uh, our co-founders are going to Singapore next week for the Earthshot Prize um, winner announcements. So um, let's hope Sea Forest is um, a winner. Sure. But um, yeah, the Earthshot Prize has been going for three years now, and each year we've had an Australian um, group in the um, in as a finalist. So really yeah, great. Yeah, down to Tasmania, I rang them and um, they they gave me a tour. Oh, like awesome. I was down there for a conference, and I was thinking, I'm just going to be around. I'll be about like an hour away. Can I come up for a visit? Sure. They, like an hour and a half, they took me through. Wow, so it's amazing. Fantastic. Yes, so um, now we'll um, move on to seahorses. So um, from seawalls to fish uh, with Mitch. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't Mitch. Hi, so my name is Mitchell. I am a PhD student at the University of Technology, Sydney, and I'm based here at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science as well, and primarily working on our newly established Sydney Seahorse Project, uh, which we established late last year, and a special thanks to the Mossman Environmental Foundation who has uh, enabled this project to happen. So we're primarily working on one species of seahorse, and that's the white seahorse or hippocampus whitei, and this is what we consider to be a medium-sized seahorse species. So it's about sixteen centimeters long, and that's if you pull their tail out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the smallest seahorse is about a centimeter, and the largest is the pot belly, which is on the wall over there, and that's about thirty-five centimeters long. Again, stretching their tail out. So the white seahorse is only found on the east coast of Australia, so it's endemic to Australia. And it's found from about Harvey Bay in southeast Queensland to Jarvis Bay in the mid New South Wales coast. They occur, they occur in coastal embayments in es and estuaries, so in relatively shallow waters up to about 18 metres at the absolute max, but typically we see them at less than 10. And now, just like we've heard from the Living Seawalls guys, this puts them in the built environment where they are subjected to coastal um, erosion, urbanisation significant effects of pollution as well. And yeah, we'll go over that in a bit more detail later. Now seahorses and in particular the white seahorse has really high habitat association and really high site fidelity. So they'll only move about a hundred meters in their entire life. And because that always leads to this question, their lifespan is about seven to eight years. They have limited home ranges, so yeah, they're only about 100 metres in their entire life. So the ones that we see down in Charter Bay will have always only been in Charter Bay. They haven't come from other locations at all. And they exist in low population density. So some of the populations themselves are 10, 20, 30 seahorses in a population or in an area. Now, seahorses are really vulnerable to habitat loss and to habitat degradation. And that's because they have this really, really unique body type, right? So they're a type of fish, which most people actually don't know, but they are a species of fish. And comparatively to some of the other beautiful fish photos that we see around in the room, uh, seahorses swim vertically. So this makes them relatively poor swimmers. And there's another species of seahorse that's considered the slowest moving fish in the entire ocean. Now they have a fused jaw. So as you can see here, this is their mouth on the front of their snout there. And most um, that's what gives them their scientific name or the family name, Signated, which is fused jaw. So seahorses and their relatives have this, so sea dragons and pipefish. And seahorses are super unique as well because they actually have no stomach, so it's a digestive tract that goes in one end and out the other, so just a highway of food. 
<laughs> this means that they eat a lot. So we'll go over that in a bit more detail as well. No stomach, yeah. <laughs> in one way or the other, so they're eating all the time. There's another species that eats up to 3,000 prey items in a day. So that's pretty much 90% of the day is what they're doing. Now, that swimming or their poor swimming is because they have really modified fins so compared to other fish species. Most fish species will use their caudal fins or their tail to swim or their pectoral fins. Uh, seahorses don't have a caudal fin at all. They have this little teeny tiny dorsal fin on their back there and their pectoral fins almost look more like ears up, the, up on the back of the head. And then they don't have the pelvic fins either. So that's why they're really poor swimmers. They use this little tiny, tiny dorsal fin on their back to propel themselves forward. And then the, um, the pectoral fins on the side of the head to navigate their way around. And then finally, in place of the caudal fin, they have a prehensile tail. So that tail is actually used to hold on to their habitat, as this little lady is doing here. Um, so you can see it wrapping around. That's actually the swimming net in Charter Bay. So because of that, they're super reliant on their habitat, and that has unfortunately led to population declines. So key habitats, such as the cauliflower soft coral or Dendronephthia australis, and the seagrass, Posidonia australis, have declined significantly. Um, the cauliflower soft coral in particular has been hugely affected in the last couple of years, primarily due to the uh, flooding events that have come from the major storm events in 2021 and 2022. Previously, it was in huge, relatively high numbers in uh, Port Stephens, and it's almost non-existent there anymore. You won't find much at all in Sydney Harbour, and there's a small amount in uh, Gamay or Bonny Bay currently. And then seagrasses are continually declining as well. And Posidonia charlotte in particular has a really low uh, recovery time as well. So the uh, decline of these habitats has led directly to the decline of seahorse numbers. So in Port Stephens, where this cauliflower soft coral has essentially been wiped out, we've seen upwards of 95% population decline in the seahorses. And then across the range of the species, so southeast Queensland to mid New South Wales, there's about a 50% decline overall. So really, really high numbers. This led to it being listed as an endangered species. So firstly, through the IUCN Red List, um, a study by Colin and Karasti. And then it has been listed in uh, legislation here as well, uh, including the Fisheries Management Act, which is the New South Wales Act, and then the um, Environmental Biodiversity Conservation Act, um, which is the federal act as well. So it's the second species of seahorse worldwide to be classified as endangered. The other one is in South Africa, so the Nisma seahorse in South Africa. And there's about 14 seahorse species that are also considered threatened. Now, because of these population declines, these habitat declines and habitat loss, there's a clear need for conservation action. And that led to us starting the Sydney Seahorse Project. So uh, again, uh, thanks to Mossman Environmental Foundation, who has been a huge supporter in getting the project going, but the, as it is a partnership between the Sydney Institute of Marine Science, the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and then UTS, and then uh, supported and funded uh, by a few uh, bodies as well. So the conservation efforts have come from a priorities action statement, which was written by the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries um, and the Fisheries and Threatened Species team. And the priorities action statement has, um, I think it's about 20 different actions that are prioritised and listed um, in terms of what needs to be done to assist the white seahorse in their recovery. So we're focusing on three key components of this, which is conservation stocking, artificial habitats or seahorse hotels and the habitat restoration as well. So the conservation stocking is a captive breeding program and this was done previously with our first release and that's our uh, paper on this as well. So in May 2020, uh, seahorse was released into Charter Bay and monitored for 12 months and after 12 months we had 20% remaining on the hotels and um, there was about 2% remaining on the swimming net in Charter Bay. So we've seen individuals cited 30 months later. So what we've um, gained from this initial release was that this is a potential conservation tool for the species. 
Now there are subsequent releases done as well, um, which didn't have as high of a success rate. Um, one release had no survivors almost immediately. So there's clearly a need for more research and that's where the Sydney Seahorse project uh, was really started because there was a need for more science and more research to be integrated into the actions that were taking place. So that allowed us to come out here and start the seahorse rearing at Sims. Party boat going past. <laughs> Um, so that, the, uh, the key focus was um, ex experimental rearing, which we hoped would improve the growth rate of the seahorses when they were in the aquarium and improve their survival. And then hopefully that would lead to them surviving or increasing their post-release survival. So after we release them, they would survive for longer in the wild. Now, our treatments in the aquarium were focused around identifying what the optimal temperature, the optimal food regimes and the optimal density was to keep them in the aquarium and get them to grow as best as possible. And now we had an overall survival of 85% from birth. Um, and that's also a little bit skewed. So that includes the uh, negative treatments as well. So our positive treatments, um, our last batch of seahorses, there was 124 seahorses born, and of them we released 121 six months later. So 98%, 97.5% survival um, from birth to release, which is, uh, yeah, fantastic results. Um, and the growth rate we managed to increase by the optimal temperature and the optimal food, and that allowed us to get to a release size, which we considered to be about five centimetres, and I'll show you why in a moment. And we were able to achieve that in about three and a half months. Um, previously, it would take about six months to get to that size. And there were no, from our perspective, or as much as we could understand, there were no negative um, side effects of that as well. The, um, the growth indexes were great. There was no increased survival at the higher temperatures when they were given the right food. Um, so we've established what the ideal methods of rearing these seahorses are moving forward and then we can implement this for all future seahorse breeding and as an example and you might have heard the term that we've been using is that we've created super seahorses but these are just ones that we've been able to grow better bigger and stronger for when they're released so these seahorses are from the same brood that was born on the exact same day um, not the best photo, but you can clearly see the size difference. And that's at about three, three and a half. Actually, that's right on four months old, those, those two seahorses there. Um, so yeah, it was almost double the length and more than double the weight. <laughs> so that allowed us to release seahorses into Chowder Bay, uh, Mossman in July, 2023. So July this year, and we released 384 seahorses. And that was from 440 that we had born this year. Um, so there they are in the bag down there. And we take them down on scuba in the bags and then release them onto the habitat that we've selected. So in this iteration, the majority were released onto the swimming net in Charter Bay. Now we monitor the seahorses in the wild. And this is why we need that ideal size as well is that we actually tag the seahorses. So for lack of better words, it's like a little tattoo that goes under the skin there. So when we release these guys, even though they are super seahorses, they still only weigh a gram. So we can't put on a tracker or we can't, we, yeah, the tags don't tell us where they are. So all we can do is give them an individual identification or an individual marker, such as these elastomer tags, and then go out and find them again. So unfortunately, Part of the reason that they're threatened is that they don't move very much, but it helps us find them again, which is nice. Um, so we're monitoring them um, the, as, as the research team. We've done three months of monitoring, so once per week, and now we're doing fortnightly, and we'll do that for the next 12 months. And then there's a citizen science component as well, where people are able to submit their photos to us, and this is or from different um, local scuba divers. So Chowder Bay is a fantastic location to be able to implement this. Um, so we have an iron naturalist uh, project that people are able to um, put this, uh, put the photos onto or submit the photos onto. And then I have to uh, sort of make my way through Facebook and Instagram and things like that as well to actually find it. Um, there's plenty of photos that get uploaded as well. But yeah, you can see a whole bunch of tags there. So little blue tag, blue tag, red, orange, 
orange. So using different color, com all of these guys have just been given one tag, but if we wanted to know the individuals as well, we could give them individual codes by different body placements and different colors. So as we get to about the six month mark, I might tag them a bit more in the wild and give them all individual codes. But so when we're doing the dives, there's about 60 seahorses that we're recapturing on every single dive. And this is in a 90 minute dive in a standardized search area. So there's more throughout the bay as well as they kind of move off away from the net. We've seen varied habitat utilization. Um, so these guys holding onto the nets, for example, we've seen them move, move off into the uh, adjacent seagrasses, so Zostra and Halophilia. We've seen them move off into uh, macroalgae, so Sargas, and there's some monoclonia. Some have made the huge journey for a seahorse, uh, 10 metres off the net to the seahorse hotels. Um, and then, yeah, we're seeing significant citizen science contributions. So whilst we're only seeing number, um, small amounts come through, it does provide us with great information as well. So one post that was made onto Facebook, actually, I was able to see that we had a seahorse that was released onto the net that was photographed by a citizen scientists on the seahorse hotel. So we know that they're moving around throughout the bay and dispersing as well. And then more recently, we've seen reproductive success. So they're moving into their breeding season and we've had upwards of 10 seahorse individuals already identified that were pregnant in the wild. I've seen two uh, female seahorses that were likely to be uh, paired with wild males. So they're actually monogamous and they'll pick a partner and stay together for life and at least through a breeding season. Um, so ones that are in close proximity, like these two there, um, being a female on your right here and a male with his inflated brooding cup, so a pregnant male there. When they're in close proximity like that, it's typically indicating that they're a pair. So as well as releasing seahorses into the wild, we also have to directly address the causes of decline. So one way that we do this is the installation of artificial or habitats called seahorse hotels. Uh, so there's currently 14 seahorse hotels in Chowder Bay. We installed five new ones this year. And then we actually installed 20 at Cobbler's Beach yesterday. So pretty cool day out on the water, 20 new ones with four different um, experimental treatments. And this is part of uh, a collaborative project that I'll touch on in a moment as well. So a seahorse hotel is a relatively basic design. It's essentially a metal cage. So that's day one. And the metal cages are put onto the bare substrate where habitat has been lost or degraded. And then over time, it accumulates all these marine organisms, so not too dissimilar to the living seawalls as well. And it gets algae and sponges and a colonial. Um, and eventually, that's the end goal. So about three years um, later in Port Stephens, that was the end result of a seahorse hotel. So essentially, we use a metal um and a lighter grade metal because the biofouling will take place and the metal will uh, over time corrode away so then essentially the idea is that we're left with a natural reef like that that's almost best case scenario sometimes they collapse in but it's still natural habitat that wouldn't have been there especially on these bare sediment um or bare substrate where things like seagrasses have been removed or lost and then directly addressing the cause of decline uh, also includes habitat restoration. So we're collaborating with Operation Posidonia for Posidonia transplanting, so this endangered seagrass as well. And that's part of that um, Seahorse Hotel installation yesterday at Cobbler's Beach. Uh, we'll include Posidonia transplanting as well, where we'll plant seagrasses around the hotel um, to see if we can co-restore seagrasses and seahorses at the same time. And then on that same idea, um, we're moving towards soft coral transplanting as well. So this has been done recently at the New South Wales UPR Fisheries up at Port Stephens, uh, where another PhD student is really focused on the soft coral and the methodologies used to, again, make it, um, allow them to grow or reattach in the aquarium onto little concrete cookies and then transplant them out into the wild. Uh, the idea being that we will transplant them out into seahorse hotels and then release seahorses onto them. And then again, that co-restoration of directly um, providing the habitat for the seahorses to then be released and uh, boost the seahorse populations. 
And then we've also done some community events, especially focused in Mossman or targeted to the Mossman local community. So as recently as last weekend at Seaside Scavenge, alongside Living Seawalls as well, um, with a little model seahorse hotel and some little pipe cleaner seahorses for kids to make. Um, but then also beach cleans, especially in Chowder Bay, where we're trying to, more than anything, make sure that the seahorse hotels stay as clean as possible and mainly rid of fishing hooks and fishing line, um, but also just cleaning the bay as a whole, so making sure that the environment um, is as clean as possible. And that's one of the great things about seahorses and seahorse conservation is that they're such a flagship species and so charismatic that people really want to help them, but it allows us to um, use them or use seahorses to improve the local environment and the ecosystem as a whole as well. So the next 12 months specifically focused on Mossman is the continued monitoring of the Chowder Bay seahorses or the seahorses that we released this year. We actually have a permit to translocate seahorses and sea nathids on plans wharf works. So there's actually wharf works taking um, place in the coming weeks on the um, wharf closest to us on Sims and we'll be moving the seahorses and ensuring that they move to a ideal location or to seahorse hotels as well. Seahorse hotels being installed into one additional site, so as well as Cobblers Beach yesterday. The co-restoration of seahorses and seagrasses at Cobblers. Co-restoration of seahorses in the soft coral. And then continue the community events and continue community engagement. Oh, thank you. That's right. You said they mainly stick to the bay. Could they? Can they exist? Can they scope up the heads? Can they, or do they have to be? Yeah, they don't move very far at all. So the pot belly seahorse can move a little bit further so you can swim between sides. But these guys will not typically not move further than 100 metres. There was another, um, my supervisor actually tagged a seahorse um, and tracked them and found that they stayed on the one piece of sponge for up to 18 months. So literally one piece of sponge. So they find a little happy place and stay and stay on it. Um, but yeah, typically they stay in the one area. And this is part of the reason that we have to do the, um, the conservation stocking or the, the direct repopulations because they're not able to repopulate from adjacent areas. They can't, um, if it's lost in one specific area or the habitat is lost, then there's not going to be a reinforcement of seahorses coming around from the next bay. It's, we need to do direct impacts to re recover that population. Yeah, I was going to say, a couple of beach being a public beach. What education is for the public or are these seahorse hotels out of reach, as it were? Yeah, so um, there's the signage done at Trader Bay already for, for there. At Cobblers, we've only just installed them and we've actually installed them in the Navy Exclusion Zone. Um, so it's a little it's a little bit out of the way. Um, but yeah, ideally, we want signage down there as well so people know what they are and know uh, what the, the process is and how we're trying to... Um, yeah, what we're trying to do for the sea horses and hopefully inform the public as best as possible. So in early stages of negotiating, the signage to be installed as well. Yeah. Um, oh, do you want to... Yeah, the other thing that I was going to ask is when the netting, we say, at Balmoral Bar mm -hmm. was replaced, um, there was uh, a bit of an outcry about the seahorse population mm -hmm. in that netting. So what happens now that, I mean, this is 30, 20 years ago, we've got a greater education nowadays. So if the um, netting, should we say, at uh, Chowder Bay is going to be replaced, do you collect all of the little hippopotamus <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. and, and move them onto the new net, or do you put the new net there and wait for a, a, a migration? Yeah, good question. It depends on the client itself. There's a bit of variability, but essentially there's going to be work done, whether it's netting or pylons or things that are going to disturb the habitat. Then there's a recommendation from fisheries and from the threatened species um, branch 
that they have to be in adjacent habitat, they're avail available. So if there's no adjacent habitat, then the recommendation is seahorse hotels or they're translocated somewhere that there is a suitable habitat. And that might be that they're translocated and moved back or they're just moved away and, and allowed to survive in a different location. But yeah, if there are any works, whether it's net, net removals or net cleanings, then there has to be something provided for them and they should be moved 24 hours before the, the cleaning takes place. Yeah. Because they're an endangered species, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and every every seahorse counts. So yeah, yeah. yeah. and Balmoral is a good one. Um, I so I didn't scuba there when there was a lot of seahorses a while ago, but I scuba there recently and there wasn't much. So um, that's on the cards as a location. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go, I'll go translocation is happening in um, the wharf just in front of Sims because it's going to be rebuilt and um, which is part of the translocation team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that includes um, other sea natives as well. So pipefish that would be using the zostra or the sea grasses around the around the pylons and then um, early stages of trialing to move sponges and soft corals that are on the pylons themselves and translocating those as well. So very early stages on, on us doing that. So, yeah, yeah, I got the way. <laughs> Main predators mm -hmm. of seahorses and other predators known to exist in the areas where the hotel is going. Yes. <laughs> um, so cuddles, for example, not the giant cuddles are up there, but um, cuddlefish and octopus in particular, ambush predators like flathead and anglerfish and frogfish. Um, so the hotels assist a little bit. <laughs> keeping predators away, especially larger animals and large pelagic fishes. When seahorses are first born, they're teeny tiny, like less than a centimetre. So anything will eat them. So part of this is that the breeding allows us to skip that first life stage where they're really vulnerable, and then we're releasing them at five, six centimetres where their survival should be increased. Because the survival from birth in the wild would probably be 1%, maybe less. Um, so unfortunately... If a seahorse can get into the hotel, an octopus can. They're able to get into anywhere, so we can't keep octopus out. So there's not too much that we can do about that. Um, but, yeah, we're providing them the habitat that they need to be able to camouflage with the habitat so they can adapt their colours to match their habitat and then have that protection um, and ability to shelter from predators. So um, providing the necessary habitat in both the hotels and um, natural habitat restoration should allow them to increase their survival and reduce predation. And next year, um, the key component of the research, because we've kind of done the component of how do we grow them the best, moving forward, the key component of the research is um, training them for the wild or I heard someone else which I'm going to steal at the moment it, it called it the other day seahorse school um so training them to the wild by introducing them to predators in captivity and trying to tell them that that's the bad guy and stay with stay away from them um but then also introducing them to what habitat they should be looking for in the wild and potentially trying to uh top them toughen them up or take them to a little seahorse gym and affect them with that because it's a pretty nice environment in the aquarium they're fed constantly they as i said before they eat all the time so we're providing them food all the time like literally hatching out millions of shrimp a day to feed them um and then it's nice gentle water flow so when they're out in the real world it's obviously a lot more going on there's a lot more currents and waves so we're trying to uh, toughen them up as well before they go out yeah. Um, what's the range um, in the harbour and what was their range? Do you know anything? In the harbour itself? Yeah. yeah. So um, tip, for the most part, you won't find them up river, sort of past the bridge. We've had some recently recruit onto some uh, artificial reefs that have been stored, in, stored under the upper house. And then every now and again, you get some odd photos from up, up river, Lake Balmain. Um, we've seen ex examples of them there. So otherwise, a lot of these coastal, like these little bays, like Chowder Bay, um, they're spread on the on the south side, so Parsley Bay and Fort Clues, and you know on the other side of Shark Beach and Mill Beach, things like that. So they're relatively dispersed throughout. Just that the population densities are um, really low these days, so the population might be like less than ten seahorses, and obviously it would only take one instance of. <laughs> you know, a flood to come through again like it has previously or one instance of pollution that can affect those individual, those small populations. So, yeah. 
That's an endangered species. Mm -hmm. The Commonwealth Environment Protection Biodiversity yep. Conservation Act. Um, there's guidelines for when you have to refer projects to the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and therefore it would be likely to have an effect on endangered species. Yep. And the test is very sensitive. So if you actually reduce an area of occupancy of the species, you're required to do a referral to the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Has any work like that been? Um, are you aware of any work like that where the Commonwealth has been involved in assessing impacts to this species? Yeah, I believe so. In the early iteration of getting the project going, and then the project as well as part, it, um, like the New South Wales UPI on like the state level has been heavily involved as well. Yep. So yeah, my, my supervisor, Dave Brasty as well. So um, yeah, on the state level, definitely. And then the, yeah, the federal level, I believe so as well. But that was prior to me commencing. So it, um, oh, yeah. I mean, sort of other projects yeah. that are around that, if you're going to replace something even known habitat for the species, then technically it's not. Negative impacts. Yeah, have a negative impact. So to reduce the area of occupancy of the species. Yeah, exactly. So you need a referral for some of those replacement works technically. Yeah. So yeah, I am not fully across it. But no, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, um yeah, we just you know, we technically we aren't doing any replacement of habitat first start. From our perspective, it's just the installation of these new artificial habitat for the installation of these um these restoration activities through the seagrasses and things like that. So we're not doing any replacement. It's just yeah, trying mm -hmm. to recover. Seahorses just look so odd. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, how did they, I mean, this, this, how did seahorses come to be? I just, I mean, because most animals just come to walk around, you can kind of work out some kind of logical evolution, but a seahorse, just looks so odd. Oh, I mean, yeah. really... uh, Seahorses might say that about us. So yeah, seahorses have existed for 25 million years. Um, they've been around for a while, so they've managed to find their niche. Um, it's only in the last 100 to 200 years that we've really seen these declines. So they progressed and developed um to be super unique in the world but they've found their ecological niche um that they've been able to thrive in they're found right throughout the world um you know there's and there's 13 species in australia that are found you know all over the world and except antarctica are pretty much the only place but every other continent you can find them so they developed these really unique um characteristics that has enabled them to thrive in the world I think it, it does seem really odd that they're so kind of uh, vulnerable to sort of change, mm -hmm. right? all, all kinds of environmental change, and they don't move very far. But isn't it that they might get all around the world? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, there's other species that move further than these guys will. There's other species that have a larger home range. There's other species that will do a thing called rafting, where they hold on to their habitat, uh, bits of habitat. So things like sargassum and like algae that so they'll allow them to actually transfer. But it's species dependent. So this species is obviously comes from Australia, settled here, and that's where they've developed these um, behavioural characteristics. But have they ever been threatened by people trying to? Catch them or use them with bait or eat them or no. whatever. Yeah, good question. Or they've always just been admired. <laughs> yeah, no, really good question. Globally, that's their biggest threat. So in Australia, it's habitat loss and degradation because they're well relatively well protected. Globally, it's over harvesting. So um in, including bottom trolling and bycatch, but direct harvesting as well. So millions of seahorses are collected on a yearly basis. Um, so they're used in the aquarium trade, so ornamental fish. Um, they're used for medicine as well, um, despite a lack of real evidence of they have a positive effect. But yeah, um, so over harvesting and the effects of bottom trolling and fishing um, is, a, is the primary threat when you look at it on a global scale. Are they edible? I mean, they bony or? There's nothing on them at all. They actually have a bony plate. 
spawn holes. <laughs> Well, very much so. There's nothing. It's nothing on them at all. Like, yeah, that that little lady there, she would literally weigh a gram. So right. there's not much on them. There's the skin that covers the sort of bony plate, um, and yeah, not much, not much else to them really. <laughs> really super simple digestive tract on the inside, but um, yeah, not much at all. When you said they're harvested overseas, are they used as bait at all? Is that Stop that purpose. Uh, well, I'm sure they would be something. Have you seen that souvenir? Like yeah, souvenir. Right now, souvenir. That's not very popular. Yeah, so. I am impressed. Yeah. 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 Yeah.